serving on the staff of the Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection as a fur bearer biologist for 17 years. He is a master's level biologist and is currently a PhD candidate in biology at UConn. His dissertation research on bobcats was recently highlighted in the Hartford Current. Jason has long been a friend of the Heartland Land Trust, serving on our board and as vice president, and also sharing his knowledge with our community in previous HLT speaker event series. <clears throat> Jason is a Heartland native and is well known to our Heartland youth as a basketball, baseball, and soccer coach. We are looking forward to hearing what Jason has been learning about our state's bobcat population. Jason Hawley. Thank you. Thank you to the Land Trust for having me again and for Bethany Church for hosting. Um, can we? Oh, Roger's got it. Is that okay with the camera? All right. If I stand right here, can everyone see and everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. So for, for this presentation tonight, um, I've done similar talks in the past for the Land Trust, and I've focused a lot on natural history. Um, but due to the research projects we've been involved in the last three years, this talk is going to be a little bit different. Um, I'm going to start with some natural history of bobcats in the state, kind of give an overview. But I'm going to get into a little more technical uh, work that we've been doing, research that you know we think is really important, learning about a lot about the ecology of bobcats in the state, which will help with the conservation of the species, not only in Connecticut, um, but across the range in North America. So some of it might be a little bit technical. I, I, I'll try not to get into too much details, but I just want to give you guys an overview of the, you know, the research we've been doing over the past three years. And I have a beautiful little helper in the back because I don't have my clicker that's going to change my slides for me. So every time, if you see me pointing in the back a lot, that's all I'm doing. So first chance, Rachel. <laughs> all right, so bobcats are the only extant, so the only um, currently uh, living felid species that we have here in the state of Connecticut. We all know there was another one, and everyone has probably a story of seeing one, but this talk is about bobcats. <laughs> it's, very, it's so often that it doesn't matter the talk I give, bears, coyotes, beavers, it always gets hijacked by mountain lions. So <laughs> we're going we're gonna to try to stick to bobcats in this talk if you, get, if you guys have any questions. You can talk to me afterwards if I'm not running out the door to get away. <laughs> um, so this is a good example of a bobcat in Connecticut. Um, they're a very common species. They're native to the state. Um, they were once very common before European settlers came along. Um, and you know, there's bobcats were kind of viewed as predator that were were also a competitor for livestock. People thought they were going to kill the children. All these things, kind of misconceptions that people had about bobcats. So we're going to go over that a little bit about what happened to the species in the state. Um, bobcats are active year-round, so unlike some other species that hibernate, um, chipmunks, woodchucks, and maybe to a lesser extent bears, uh, winter is actually a great time to be a bobcat. It's a great time for them, for them to be out there hunting. Some of their prey species can't move as well as they can in the snow, so it's a, a very uh, active time for bobcats. Um, I get a lot of, I add this slide, can you hit it one more time, Rachel? I get a lot of people, you know, calling me and emailing me and saying, oh, I saw a lynx. And so I, I try to add this into my talks because we do, we do not have a lynx population in Connecticut. I think the closest population are up in Maine, maybe the northern parts of Vermont. Um, and there's some, there's some fairly obvious differences. So you can see, um, for one, bobcats have, or lynx have much longer legs, bigger feet, um, longer ear tufts on the top. You can see the long ear tufts on the lynx. 
And bobcats appear a lot more stocky than a lynx. Um, and another slide coming up next. Keep it in again. So this is a good example of a lynx. Oh, I should have asked what this one was. So, uh, so, you, so you can see the very, the very obvious. Can you guys see over there? Right? The obvious big feet. Um, are there any kids in here that can maybe take a guess on why lynx have big feet? Back there, too. Uh, so they can walk on snow quick? That's exactly right. right? So <laughs> the areas where they live, there tends to be a lot more snow. So they have kind of built-in snowshoes so they can stay on top of the snow. And another real easy way, if you see this, see how the tip of their tail is completely black? On a bobcat, you'll have that, but you also have some white on the end of the tip. So um, it's not always easy to see that. But the big difference is if like, you really look at you know, how oversized those legs look on the lynx. You just don't see that on a bobcat. So physical description, um, again, kind of like I described, bobcats appear very stocky, um, especially the males, muscular. Um, they're sort of compact compared to a lynx. You can just keep hitting it a few times, Rich. Obviously, they have a short bobbed tail. As we can see right here in this one, that's where they get their name. Um, there's a lot of theories as to why bobcats don't have long tails. Um, I can tell you in, throughout our research, I have a pretty good theory. It's because they spend a lot of time in really thick, thick brush moving through, and probably a long tail wouldn't be very advantageous for them. Um, our adult males, and every, everything I'm giving you is specific to Connecticut or the Northeast, so some of these sizes and colorations can change a little bit across the range, especially when you get into the Southwest. But our adult males are anywhere from 18 to 35 pounds. We have weighed a few that were close to 40 pounds. I think the largest one we weighed was 39 pounds. So. Um, the big males, they, they can get pretty big. Um, they're great climbers. Can you hit it again, Rach? Females, again, this is adult females, um, 12 to 25 pounds. 25 pounds would definitely be on the higher end of, of their size. Uh, one more time, Rach. Um, they often have this dark brown stripe on their back. As you can see in this one right here, that's usually pretty common. With most bobcats, sometimes it can be a little bit lighter. And white underneath is, is something that all bobcats across their range have in common. So you can see, even though there's spots underneath this bobcat, um, their, their underbelly is always white. Um, and usually the spots are a little more noticeable underneath. Um, another common thing is these, what we call ear bands behind the ears. So there's a lot of theories as to why these are there. Um, probably one of the most common ones is it looks like eyes in the back of their head. So if something was coming up behind them, you know, some, you know, another bobcat or something or another animal that had ill intentions might, you know, think that the bobcat. So another common trait that our bobcats have. Um, so this is a, what I would say is a, an average bobcat in Connecticut. Now this can vary quite a bit. So you can, you can visibly see spots on this cat. Some of our bobcats, well, especially in the east, our bobcats tend to be less spotted. Some of them can actually appear like they don't have any spots at all. They can vary from sort of a grayish color to a rusty brown or tan color. Um, but in Connecticut, Oh, this is another one where you can see the white tip on the tail, which uh, differentiates it from the lakes. Um, but again, this is just a, a good representative of uh, what bobcats would look like in Connecticut. So bobcat range. Um, this is kind of an older map, just because I, you know, I stole this from someone else that made it. I haven't updated it, but um, it's probably. You know, clearly it's filled in in this area, and definitely range is filled in in most of the Midwest. So, um, bobcat ranges throughout most of the United States, and it extends quite a ways down into Mexico and in parts of um, Canada. So, bobcats are a very adaptive species. They can live in boreal forests. They can live in deserts. Um, they're they're very adaptable. 
Um, they can change their prey species pretty easily, and they do that pretty regularly, which we will talk about a little bit later. Rachel. Click it a couple times. So these are kind of some of the things that we went into this research knowing. Um, but again, you know, it's easy to take numbers from someone else's research or somebody else's guesses. You don't really know. But we kind of wanted to figure out, you know, what was happening with our population in the state and how, what we could do to better conserve the species as far as, especially in a, in a highly developed and urbanized state like Connecticut. Um, we wanted to identify, you know, types of habitats might be different in Connecticut. We're a very urban state, um, so we really want to know what these cats are doing in our state. And a lot of the information you'll get is their home ranges or territories are 80 to square miles, which, what does that really tell you? I mean, that's like, you could just say one to 100 square miles. It doesn't really tell you a whole lot. Um, so we, we kind of wanted to do our own research and figure out what these cats are doing in the state. Um, one thing that's common across all studies, and um, I guess I'll, I'll ruin the surprise a little bit, it also turned out being true in Connecticut, is bobcats love thick understory. So just imagine like the thickest, nastiest habitat that you would never want to walk through. That's heaven for a bobcat. Um, a lot of invasive species, autumn olive, multiflora rose, things like that. And the reason for this is bobcats are ambush predators. So they like to get into thick cover, especially on the edge of good hunting habitat. In Connecticut, that often ends up being someone's yard where there's a bird feeder, where squirrels come to the bird feeders, and bobcats will just sort of lay down in this thick understory habitat where they can't be seen. As you can see, very well camouflaged wait for an unsuspecting squirrel to walk by, and then pounce on it. So they're, they're very, very effective predators, especially when they have good cover. Um, there's a little bit of a misconception that, that bobcats associate a lot with rocky outcroppings, and they do it to a certain extent. Um, and it's probably mostly because of maybe some prey species that might exist there, porcupines, things like that. But, for the most part, um, this is sort of an older idea that bobcats spend a lot of time in these rocky outcrops. And we have found that they do, but not quite as much as if you read some of the older literature. Um, wetlands. So wetlands are, are, again, this is another one of those common habitats that you see across studies across North America that bobcats really associate with. Oh, again, it probably has to do with, as you can see, all the really thick, thick cover along the sides of the wetlands. Again, good ambush habitat, and there's a lot of good prey species for them in those wetland habitats. Um, in Connecticut, uh, we have a little bit of a different story, right? So we have a very urbanized state, so bobcat habitat looks a lot different in Connecticut. And this is kind of one of our hypotheses, one of our predictions. Uh, well, with all the neighborhoods, suburban backyards that have bird feeders and great rabbit habitat and squirrels and chipmunks, you know, and just based on a lot of the sightings we get, our thought was, well, maybe bobcats in Connecticut are associating more with these backyard habitats. Um, because we get a lot of sightings, I can't tell you how many sightings and emails I get sent to me like this with people. Yeah, I, I saw this bobcat in my, on my back porch, and I could just see in its eyes that it wanted to attack us. <laughs> Which, I don't know, I don't see that in that cat's eyes. But apparently some people do. Um, so um, we get a lot of you know, bobcats uh, foraging and hunting in people's yards. Sometimes you know, that's even coming up on someone's porch. Because you imagine if you're a bobcat in Connecticut, you really can't be terrified of, of houses, right? You couldn't make a living in Connecticut if you were terrified of people and houses. So we find a lot of these sort of habituated cats that aren't completely habituated in the way you think a bear is habituated. Um, they're not you know, trying to approach people for food. It's just they're, they're sort of identifying Um, I just wanted to throw this one there. It's another good example of sort of a different 
color phase, kind of that rusty, I don't know if I have a good picture in here of, of a true gray one, um, but I gotta find one. Um, but it's, it's some of these color phases in Connecticut would just be completely gray with no spots on them whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, another example of the same cat. Does anyone know, is this a male or a female fun cat? Yeah. Yeah. It's a male, right? So it's actually very difficult, um, usually, I guess this guy's maybe uh, luckier than most males. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell pretty obviously from him, but believe it or not, very often even when we have them in hand, it can be difficult to identify males versus females just because, you know, the males very often don't have a lot going on, so it's going to be difficult to tell But this one's giving us a good view, so we know it's a <laughs> Very often, it's just kind of the size. You can tell the males are bigger and kind of stockier and more muscular. Uh, just another good example of kind of, you know, the, the pictures that we get sent to us, the way bobcats move through these suburban areas. Um, this is a, maybe a little better example of kind of that grayer face, still a little bit brown, but again, it's in someone's backyard. Um, so bobcats are true carnivores. Um, all right, we got any kids other than Caden? That, does anyone know what a carnivore is? What's a grayer? Right, so they eat meat. So bobcats are, are true carnivores. So taxonomically, there are other animals that are, that are carnivores, um, like coyotes that eat things other than meat, right? So coyotes will eat berries, you know, kind of whatever they can find. Bobcats are a little different. They are true carnivores, so that's why you see this dentition, right? So there's really nothing for chewing here. Um, their carnassial teeth here, and their canines are simply meant for grabbing when you guys get a chance after you come look at this bobcat skull. So for a bobcat, when they eat, they use their canines to just grab onto their prey, right? And they'll hold it, and that's how they kill their prey. And then once they have it on the ground um, where they can start eating, they literally just rip pieces of flesh off with their carnassials and swallow it whole. So there's not a lot of chewing that goes on. And this is pretty common for, for true carnivores. So uh, they're not out there eating grass and kale and whatever. <laughs> They're after, they're after meat, then. and they actually do, they will scavenge, but they, they prefer hunting for and killing their, their own prey. All right, Rachel, next slide. Um, bobcats can take up down animals as big as deer. So if you imagine that, you know, I told you the largest bobcat we've ever weighed in Connecticut is, is 39 pounds. So, you know, the average maybe uh, male would be 32 pounds. So they're able to, through their ambush ability, to take down a deer over 100 pounds. So pretty amazing predators. Um, and, you know, we had, I have never witnessed this directly. I've come close to witnessing it, but I would love to someday see a bobcat actually take. I've gotten there like right after it happened. I knew it and I just missed it. But um, they are they're amazing predators. Um, another common um, thing that bobcats will do, so if you're walking through the woods and you find a deer that's been killed and you see it's covered up with leaves, especially like a freshly killed deer, uh, this is called caching behavior. Um, and bears will do this a little bit, but not quite as much as, as cats, especially bobcats. So if you're walking through the woods and you find a dead deer and it's covered with leaves, Sometimes they'll even cover it with its own fur that they've pulled off of it. Um, it's very likely that it was a bobcat kill, or that is a bobcat kill to be found. Um, so this one, I was walking through the woods, and I said, oh, that looks like, uh, well, actually, I got a better story with this one. So, <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you, sometimes I go on tangents, but people like my tangents. <laughs> so I got a call on this one from some people in Canton, and they were roofers, and they said, we saw a mountain lion kill a bobcat from the roof. They were up on the roof. And I was like, oh, really? That's cool. And they're like, yeah, the deer are still there. Huh. And they're, 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 the mountain lion put leaves and stuff on it. So I went out there with my trail camera. I was like, this is cool. If there's a mountain lion here, which I didn't believe, I'm going to get a picture of it. 
And the only animal I got coming back here was Bobcat. <laughs> so, um, and he was, you know, he came pretty regularly for a couple nights. And the reason they cover it is to stop other predators or scavengers from, you know, finding their, their kill and taking their calories. Um, again, so kind of as we talked about, bobcats are, you know, urban hunters. They'll, we get, you know, reports all the time. And it, it's pretty amazing. Can you imagine, like, having to make a living by catching things like rabbits, which are notoriously fast, chipmunks, squirrels, deer, with your mouth and your paws. I mean, they're amazing. Um, th and this, this rabbit, I think, had no idea that this bobcat was, <laughs> was, about, to, was about to get it. It's just incredible like how fast they are and how agile they are. They're extremely effective predators. A lot of people don't realize that they'll climb. They'll go right up trees after squirrels. Um, this incident on the right, I think, was down somewhere in like the Wil Wilton, Connecticut area. And there were some squirrels that went up in the tree. And the bobcat was hunting the squirrels. And the squirrels went up in the tree, and they thought they were safe. But they weren't, because the bobcat followed them right up in the tree. So they're, they're also uh, really good climbers. Uh, bobcat tracks. Um, these pictures are a little, I think, elongated, but in general, bobcat tracks have a very round appearance to them, and it's very rare to see claws registering in the track. So you don't see any claws up here. You'll kind of see, I have some better pictures after, you'll see this triple lobe down here on the heel pad. Um, that's very common you see in a bobcat track. I don't know if you can see it any better. And you'll also see sort of a, a, a double lobe up here on the top, which I think I have a better picture of in one of the following slides. Uh, so this is coyote. You see the difference, right? Um, tend to be more elongated, oval-shaped tracks. And with coyotes, the claws will, coyotes and dogs, um, the tracks will, or the claws will almost always register in a track. So a pretty quick and simple way to tell the difference between a bobcat and canid coyote track. Um, gait is, is actually pretty unique with a bobcat. This is, I would say, pretty common gait that you'll see in a bobcat. So you just, you don't very often see a lot of double registered tracks. Um, but kind of that back and forth pattern through, you know, whatever substrate they're walking in. Um, shows up a little bit better here. You can kind of see that lobe on the top. Um, their tracks are usually pretty, especially in snow, very easy to see. Go ahead, Rich. So just a little reference for size. Um, fairly, you know, fairly small. Some of the males will have bigger front feet, but it's pretty common. Um, looking bobcat track. Um, I don't even know how this one is here, but a lot, a lot of times you can't see that the lobes on the bottom or the top, especially in snow, but you see kind of that really rounded uh, appearance to the track and no claws registering. So sometimes if the track isn't clear, you can still determine bobcat versus king. Um, Again, I, I think I put this one here. See this just very round shape to this track. So sometimes you won't be able to see any of the pads or anything, but you can still kind of tell it's a bobcat track just from that super round shape to the track. Uh, yeah, I was hoping you can see it. This isn't very clear. But you can see that a little bit of that triple lobe, and right here you can see that double lobe, so a little indentation on the top of the heel pad. Oh, my volume's not working. Rachel, <laughs> turn up a little more. So this is common kind of mating behavior. This is most likely two males that are territorial. This often happens in. February when the mating occurs, um, two males kind of displaying their dominance, saying, I'm the dominant guy around here. Um, these females in this area are mine. 
back off or you're going to get trouble. Although you will, some people get confused because you will sometimes see this behavior when actual mating occurs between a male and female. They'll kind of get, you know, a little mouthy with each other before they mate. Um, so sometimes it's hard to determine. Uh, often for me, it's looking at the size. If I, two, if I see two animals that are pretty stout, big looking, it's most likely two males. So this is one of my favorite. This is in the Olive Garden parking lot in Manchester, over in Hawking Hills. It says someone sent us this and they're trying to get it in their car. The red one? And, yeah, yeah. And the, you know, they're, when, the, when they're in this mode, they're in their own world. They don't care what's going on around them. You know, they're in a fight with another male and they're just oblivious to everything that's going on around them. Kind of like deer during the rut, if there are any hunters here, right? That's when they kind of get stupid and forget about what's going on around them. Similar with, with bobcats. Um, so mating occurs in February, for the most part, from what we found in Connecticut. Um, kittens are usually born in April or May. Um, our litter sizes that we have found in the state, which I'm going to get into a little bit later, have been anywhere from one to four kittens per litter. Um, when the kittens are born, they're fairly helpless. You know, they rely on everything from their mother until they're, you know, a few weeks old. They might, or a couple months old, actually really, really start moving around uh, with the female. And, and believe it or not, bobcat uh, females are very good mothers. They're very attentive. attentive. They come back to their den regularly. Um, and actually, the first two weeks after they have their kittens, they rarely leave the den. They'll leave, you know, maybe once a day to go hunting or something. For the most part, they're staying right there with their kittens. Um, and then by this time of year, uh, we get a, we get re often get reports of well, I saw three or a pack of bobcats, right? So bobcats are are solitary animals. They don't. They don't uh, run in packs like canids do, like coyotes or wolves. So when you see a group like this of, you know, more, two, three, or four more bobcats, it's almost always going to be a female with her kittens. And what happens this time of year, the kittens are just as big as, the, as their mother. So it's, mm. it's very difficult to determine which ones are the kittens. <laughs> Um, even for me, sometimes, you know, I, it can, kids tend to have a certain look to them, but it can still be difficult to, to really determine which one's the female, which one's the kittens. I don't know, on this one, I think maybe this, this one right here is the mother of the two kittens over on the rock there. Um, and again, in the winter, so very often the kittens will stay with their mother straight through the winter and even almost up until the next breeding season, um, they'll stay with her. I imagine by the time February comes along when she's ready to breed again, um, probably a male following her around tends to push the kittens away from the female and that's probably when it's sort of a forced dispersal when they'll move their mother or move away from their mother. Um, so, just to take a step back, um, as far as the specific history of bobcats in Connecticut, so again, as I said, they're a native species, um, you know, back in the 1800s and even the early 1900s, bobcats were considered a threat to agriculture and game and even people. So bobcats were killed through poisoning, trapping, unregulated hunting. Um, their fur was worth money at the time, so um, our population really, really declined. We don't, th we don't think bobcats were ever fully extirpated from the state, so we think there was always like a small population. If, I remember I've looked back through the old Connecticut, what we were calling Connecticut fishing, and every year there was at least a couple bobcats that were harvested in the state. So we think they were always here. But probably in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s, they were at very, very low numbers. Um, so the status has changed quite a bit, um, especially over the last 20, 30, even 50 years. So believe it or not, 
um, Connecticut had a bounty. Well, not all of Connecticut, but certain towns did. I like to add this one in here. Um, because Granby actually had a bounty all the way up until, I think, 1970, they had a, bo a bobcat bounty. Um, I always love showing this because sometimes when I'm in Granby or bordering towns, people know this guy, Bob Pennington. Anyone know Bob Pennington? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, one time, Bob Pennington was in the audience when I gave it. He's like, hey. um, So that changed in 1972 um, when the commissioner officially protected bobcats in the state. So all the way up until 1971, they were harvested, and there was even a bounty in, uh, in many towns. So you can imagine if they were already at low numbers, and that certainly didn't help anything with their recovery. <coughs> Uh, so as I said, podcast being protected in 1972. <laughs> and if we go back to, again, so there, there were always sightings of bobcats recorded in our records throughout the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 60s, and 70s, but very, very low. And then in the 80s, we started to get more regular sightings up in the northwest part of the state. Um, this probably had something to do with old abandoned farms that were sort of <coughs> growing back up, getting a lot of that early successional habitat that bobcats love, as we talked about, that we call it TTB, thick thorny brush habitat that they love. Um, and probably also some immigration from Massachusetts, where we think there's probably a little bit of a healthier population up there. So this is where bobcats really started showing up in numbers in the state. So this is just going to kind of show you the progression of the recolonization or recovery of the species in the state. So this is 1990, 91, you can see how it's moving. 96, 97, we're moving to eastern Connecticut now. 2000, 2003, 2006, and I think our most recent one. Go back to that. Okay. So by 2011, 2012, um, I mean, there's a couple towns that maybe haven't had sightings down there. But currently, we've had sightings in every town in the state, including, well, we even have, I'll show you some pictures. We even had a bobcat that lived in Bridgeport and spent a lot of his time there. Um, the research we're doing right now, we're trapping bobcats in Hartford. Literally, like in downtown Hartford, in Caney Park, not far from St. Francis Hospital. Um, so they're, they're, it's incredible. You know, there was a time where, where people thought bobcats were sort of this wild, which they are, wild species that needed large, large tracts of undeveloped land without people. And now, over the last 10, 15 years, we've learned a lot more. We know that, well, they don't really need that. And in fact, maybe they thrive. In, in these suburban and even urban habitats. So again, this is another one of my slides that needs to be updated, but it gives you, it kind of gives you the idea. So road kills are in that orangish pink color, but really um, probably the better <coughs> index is sightings. Uh, so you can see back to 90, 91, you know, around 25, and you know where we are currently is just we, we get sightings like people don't even call us in call sightings in anymore they're just so common I mean throughout the entire state and in fact eastern Connecticut I think we probably get more sightings now than western Connecticut so if you remember initially in the 80s a lot of sightings were in the northwest now they're pretty much statewide and a lot of them are in, are in eastern Connecticut so a little bit of work we did before this current study. Um, don't really focus on, I mean, you can read the top part if you want, but really we did this spawn survival study um, just, you know, because there was a lot of concern. We weren't seeing a lot of fawns. This was done in Northwest Connecticut. We wanted to see, well, what's happening to our deer fawns? Um, and there were a lot of things, you know, a lot of them died, mowing, natural, shot, poached. Bears, 12% of fawns were taken by bears, but really surprisingly, 60% um, of, our, of our deer fawns were killed by bobcats, and those are the ones that were confirmed. 
So right away we were like, okay, you know, there's they're definitely have a, having a significant impact on deer. What other species are they are they having a significant impact? Like turkeys is one that comes to mind because we've had sort of a declining turkey population over the last um, five to maybe ten years. Um, and really, this is kind of depressing. Only 35% of our fawns actually survive during that study. So what do bobcats eat? Um, this is the data we've collected from roadkill bobcats. So bobcats that were killed on the road, and we collected the samples. And 43% of the stomachs had squirrel. It says red and gray up there, but most of them were gray squirrels. Um, so they really like to target squirrels. I think a lot of that is kind of what I was talking about. In people's backyards, they have bird feeders, and squirrels come in, the bobcats sit there, and it's a perfect predator trap for bobcats to come in. Um, cottontail rabbits, very important, white-tailed deer. A lot of that could just be scavenging, especially in the winter, from winter-killed deer, where bobcats will go in and scavenge, especially the fresh deer. Um, birds, that includes turkeys, um, even domestic birds, <coughs> muskrats, um, we, we find those quite a bit. So they're, they're very adaptable predators. Um, porcupines, grouse, chipmunks. We've even found cases of cannibalism with other bobcats in their stomachs. Uh, so they have a pretty diverse diet. So knowing everything, that we knew, um, we decided, well, we don't think we know enough, right? Because a lot of this information is sort of like from indices, right? Like road kills, sightings, uh, work that's been done in other states. So we decided to initiate our own study here in Connecticut. So the first part of the study was what's called an occupancy study. So it's basically you put cameras out all across the landscape in Connecticut and you see how many pictures of bobcats you get. I'm not going to get into the details of occupancy modeling because honestly, that part of the study was done by a master's student on the project. I don't even really completely understand the occupancy modeling and the math behind it, but I'll just tell you a little bit about how it works. So we started this. Um, using this app called iNaturalist, and basically people can go in and can report sightings, and you can see that most of our sightings came from all the way across the state. Um, and like I said before that, our data were limited to public sighting reports, um, information from trappers, and vehicle kills. But it was a good starting place for us to kind of see where bobcats are being uh, sighted by the public. So the way occupancy works, you know, we kind of know bobcats are in more rural areas, but we really wanted to focus on, okay, what are bobcats doing when they get into these more highly developed areas, like suburban and urban areas? Are they even there? Um, so we started by randomly picking these sites, um, but random within a certain uh, housing density, so higher housing densities. Is, so each one of those black dots is one of our uh, sample sites. Um, and this is down here, you can see the, if you guys can see that, anyways, it's um, houses per kilometer squared. So from zero to 200, all the way up to uh, 800 to 1,000. So pretty urban when you get to that 800 to 1,000 buildings per kilometer squared. Um, and there was, there was a bit of a problem with this in that occupancy models don't work too well if you get bobcats at every site. And we essentially had bobcats at every site. So we were like, okay, back to the drawing board for season two because we were seeing them at every single site. So, and what we're really trying to get at is, well, how urban is too urban for these cats? So, Part of the problem with this is we use the census data for our uh, first season, and Microsoft came out with this building layer um, right at the end of our first season. So we kind of went back to the drawing board. And part of, the, part of the problem is when you use census data, so this whole block here, 
right? It's just listed at either 800, or it was 800 to 1,000 houses per kilometer square. And that doesn't really give us a good idea of what's happening. Can you hit it one more time, Rich? Oh. Hit it one more time. Go back to it. I don't know why my circle is in there. So there's supposed to be a circle that pops up right here. Um, so the nice thing about the Microsoft building layer is it showed us like the actual building. So we got a much, much better idea of what that housing density was in our, in our sample sites. So this one showed up as 1,000 in our first year. But our circle, our sample site, ended up being right up here. And we realized we were way off because the actual number was about 270 buildings per kilometer square. So um, it's giving us a much better idea of what type of housing density these bobcats are pounding with. Um, so we kind of went through and resampled in much higher housing densities. You can see, I don't know if it says Bridgeport or something down here. So we kind of really focused on these higher, higher urban areas for, for season two. Um, and we came up with a 56% occupancy rate, which was much better, worked with the model much better. Uh, Bobcats were at 14 of the 25 sites. And regularly, we found that Bobcats were spending time in habitats up to 944 buildings per kilometer square, which is urban. So this was kind of a, a little bit eye-opening for us. We were like, wow, I mean, these cats are, are really spending a lot of time in these urban areas. Well, why are they doing that? And why are they there? So that kind of became the next question. <laughs> um, and the idea is there's this risk versus reward, right? So bobcats do view humans and human establishment as a risk, right? So um, if I spend a lot of time crossing roads, if I spend a lot of time around people, there is a risk. But there's also a great reward because there's a lot of food. Humans kind of create, if you think about it, they create perfect bobcat habitat, right? So we like these open areas um, where squirrels and cottontails, and then we like these thick areas. If you go into urban areas, you'll see a lot of the areas that can't be developed tend to be wetlands and kind of thick invasive habitats, which is just perfect for a bobcat. So we have unintentionally created perfect bobcat habitat throughout suburbia and even urban parts of Connecticut. Um, and a lot of these cats, I mean, there's personality involved. You know, some cats are more willing to deal with that or to put up with it than others. Um, but most of our cats um, really love suburban and urban habitats. So we're, we wanted to look into that a little further. Um, this is some of the technical stuff. I'm not going to get into this too much, but um, you know, some of our questions are, so to what degree bobcats use these intermixed systems um, with anthropogenic, that's just human features, buildings, um, you know, just roads, things like that. And is there a level of urbanization where bobcats will switch? So, they're so, so we think our, our hypothesis was they're selecting for um, houses, they want to be near because that's where the food is, but is there a level that's too much for them? You know, they like to be close, but not too close. So where is that? And how can we maybe maintain some of those distances in the future, right? So future conservation, we all think development's going to just all of a sudden magically stop in Connecticut. So it could be, you know, an important thing for us to know what, what <coughs> level of urbanization do we need to maintain to keep bobcats in these areas because they're a very important predator. They'll control nuisance species, raccoons, skunks, possums that tend to cause problems in these areas, even rats. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they are an apex predator in Connecticut. So we really wanted to find out, you know, how we can best conserve and keep that species in these types of habitats. So we use what's called an integrated step selection analysis, um, which. I'll, I'll briefly explain, explain really quickly. And some other things we wanted to look at is, you know, is it, is it males that are, are more brave, so they're going into these areas? Um, females, kittens, what's happening? Who's going and using these habitats? 
So we went uh, across the state, we sort of identified this gradient of low to high housing densities. We wanted to sample all along that gradient. Um, so we kind of have our controls, right, of very rural habitats, all the way up to high housing densities. So um, these red and yellow triangles are where we collared bobcats for our first field season. So the, the light color is real high housing density, which were harder to catch cats in that area because there's not as many there. Um, but we did a fairly good job this season, this first season and the second season kind of covering that gradient. Um, trapping can, could be very challenging at times. Bobcats, they're very fickle animals. Uh, it's amazing how many times they'll walk by your trap and they'll look in and they won't go in. And then the next day, for whatever reason, they'll go in a trap. So it, it can be very challenging um, to implement a study like this. Uh, we use primarily cage traps. Um, we've got some, well, quite, a, quite a bit of non-targets. We just had one today. We're trapping in Hartford. And a raccoon showed up to our trap before a bobcat got there, got caught, and then the bobcat showed up and the <laughs> trap was closed with the raccoon in it. So it can be a very frustrating and challenging experience. Stunks are another common one. I don't think anyone's been sprayed with stunks yet. But, uh, red foxes, gray foxes. Uh, so just to give you an idea of just kind of how nonchalant and eh, bobcats are when they're considering this bobcat just as easily could have walked away, but he was like, well, I don't know. Maybe I'll check this out. Something smells good in there. Something looks good in there. Let me go in. And then we're done. So, and again, we, don't, we just come tranquilize the cat and put a necklace and the New York Times on it and we'll let it go and then it becomes an ambassador for bobcats everywhere. This is giving us great ecological data uh, to use for conservation. Uh, we get a lot of pictures like this of bobcats just looking into our trap. Yeah, I'm not that hungry. I'm not going to go in there. Frustrating. Uh, bobcats going in. Sometimes the traps will freeze, especially in the winter. The bobcat goes in jumps on the trap a couple times and it still doesn't go off. Um, next. Sometimes when you catch bobcats, this, this bobcat is not a trap and they just don't want to leave. They want to stay there and tell you what they think about you catching them. Sometimes I have to kind of scare them away a little bit before I can reset the trap. Oh, I have an assist, a special assistant here that is going to demonstrate for you guys how our bobcat traps work. Right here? <laughs> Let's put it up here so everyone can see it. So this is a very common, this is probably the most common bobcat trap we use. Can you help me set it? All right, he's got it. We do use foothold traps. Uh, we try to avoid them in the winter when it gets cold, so primarily what we're using is, is cage traps, and they are quite effective, um, but again, you know, it, it depends on the time of year, it depends on the cat. Okay, so what kind of a football trap do you have? Uh, we use, we use um, MB-550s, so it's, it's Minnesota brand 550, they're padded traps, they have pads on them, and we usually keep cameras on them. Very low risk, obviously, or you wouldn't use them? Very low risk. I mean, foothold traps in general are, uh, are very safe. I mean, they're a string device. They get a bad name, but a huge percentage of the ecological and biological data that we have on many endangered species across the world would not have been collected without foothold traps. So they have kind of a bad name, but foothold traps have done a lot for wildlife conservation. Wolves is one that comes to mind. Most of all the wolf research that has been done and all the data we have wouldn't have been collected without foothold traps. So they're very, a very important tool and very safe when used correctly. This might be loud, so get ready. So very, it's a very simple device, right? So and the bobcat's fairly safe when it's in there. Um, good job. All right, uh, next switch. 
Uh, and once we do what we need to do, we'll often put them back in the trap or, oh, I hope, did I hit something here? No. Um, we'll put them back in the trap, we'll leave them right where they were caught. Um, and then they're just going to them. Then usually the next time we see them or hear from them is, you know, from their, their data. Um, there's another, oh, I put that I timed this room. This my, another one of my good helpers out in the woods. Uh, my kids spent a lot of time out there helping me out, getting good experience. Uh, it's great to have them out there. Good job, buddy. <laughs> Sometimes they get a little over. <laughs> hey, it's Danny. <laughs> All right, next one. Are you supposed to have gloves on there? Oh, we also had we also had a lot of help from a, a local dentist that some of you might know that happens to be in the audience today <laughs> over there, <laughs> Dr. Kirschbaum. Um, so one of the things the first season we were doing is we were we were trying to age our cats. And it requires removing one of their a smaller tooth. Um, I think we initially started with one of the front um, incisors. Uh, it proved to be a very difficult task, and we weren't getting great ages from the cats that way. Uh, so we called, we called in the big guns, Dr. Kirschbaum, to help us out with this. And he did. He was able to remove a couple teeth with his very fancy techniques. Um, so that's what the tooth looks like once we remove it. Um, it doesn't hurt the bobcat, it's not a tooth that they use. You know, it's just an incisor, the incisor, they're not using it as I described, they're primarily using their canines and their carnassials. But we just weren't getting reliable ages from our cats. One of the things we wanted to look at is you know, how different age cats are, are acting, but it didn't really work out as far as aging. Uh, we used a lot of volunteer trappers for this project all across the state, which was a very productive uh, way to get cats ca captured and collared. Our volunteers captured over, over 70 cats for us, which was a, a huge help for us. So this study is, to my knowledge, the largest bobcat study ever done as far as the number of cats collared. Uh, so we ended up with, which I'll get into in a minute, and hope I'm not running out of time. Next slide, Rachel. Um, so all cats that were large enough to be fitted with a collar were fitted with a, a GPS collar, which took a location on them every four hours, which gave us pretty good data on where they were moving, what type of habitat they were using. Next, Rachel, I think I'm one of the times we're going to try to go quick. Um, all cats were released unharmed, um, we did our best, uh, I think the best technique we came up with is maybe in the next, yeah, so we use these very kennels, so a lot of people will catch, a lot of researchers will catch the cats and just kind of leave them there to recover on their own, but we were concerned about them, you know, running into a stream because they're still partially dry, so we allowed all our cats to recover in these very kennels um, before we released them, we wanted them to be fully recovered. Uh, this is what a release looks like, a little slow motion. Um, they're very happy to get back out into their home range and territory and very excited to collect us great data. Next, Rachel. So we ended up for the first two field seasons with 106 um, collared cats, which is a great sample and it was kind of all along that gradient of low to high housing density. Well, again, this is with help of homeowners, volunteer trappers, and obviously all of us at DEP. Um, we got a lot of videos sent of us, or to us of our, our collared cats. Again, classic moving through a, a wetland and swamp area. Uh, our data was, was pretty interesting. So this is actually done in Greenwich, and this is the airport. And you can see how this cat Really used a lot of this early successional habitat. So all the same cat. What's that? That's all the same That's cat. all one cat, yep. Mm -hmm. um, so you could, I think this one was a female. Am I right on that? Yeah, female. Um, so they tend to have smaller home ranges, but you can see how they really like that kind of brushy habitat that's right up against development, which was one of our hypotheses. Um, so it was, it was cool to see that. 
Um, so what the what movement actually looks like, right? So this is a bobcat in Hartford, um, and you can see kind of they'll make bigger movements, and when they get into those urban areas, they're kind of making smaller movements, which is which indicates that they're probably hunting or foraging when they're in those urban areas, probably in people's backyards, um, catching squirrels. Um, so kind of following with some of our predictions and hypotheses so far is the way they, they move in those urban habitats. Um, I'm not going to get into this a lot, but we used sort of a, again, it's called an integrated step selection analysis. So basically the way it works is the model looks at all the movements that the cat has made, right, that you know it's made, and then it comes up with all these available spots or possible spots the bobcat could have gone and it compares the habitats right so what was available available versus where the cat actually went so it shows us preference right if all these different types of habitats are available at all different levels but the cat keeps choosing this habitat and then it starts to show us preference preference for a habitat preference for distances from other features I think we're going to skip through a few slides here because this gets a little practical. It's basically just what I what I showed you, just a different. So for every step movement um, from one location to another, the model does that exact thing. So it's a long process, but with the computers we have in the it can happen pretty quickly. Um, so what we found was bobcats prefer to be close to buildings, to houses. Um, and they move slower and reverse directions more often when they're close to buildings, which, as I said, kind of indicates hunting behavior, right? So when they're in these houses, they're at, or near these houses, they're foraging. Um, and at the same time, they avoid roads, and they prefer to be in or close to wetlands. So we even found that bobcats will even choose to be closer to buildings if there's good cover nearby. So if there's wetlands or thick habitat, they'll then be even closer to buildings. So they're really trying to push the envelope, that whole risk reward we were talking about. If there's good cover nearby, they're going to be as close to the houses as they can because that's where the food is. And surprisingly, we also found females with kittens were even higher on that spectrum. So probably due to um, you know, demands for more food because they, they're feeding kittens. So they're spending even more time closer to houses, especially when cover habitat is available because they got kittens to feed. They can't move as much because the kittens aren't as mobile. So they're spending a lot of time in these urban, suburban areas, just hammering squirrels, chipmunks, rats, all the nuisance species. So bobcats are a good thing, especially in cities where you have problems with a lot of these pest species, rats, raccoons, things like that. Um, so this, again, a little bit technical. Don't pay attention to the long RSS. So basically, this shows you the distance that bobcats are regularly choosing to be from buildings. So it's somewhere around 180 meters. And this is for all our bobcats lumped together. So females, males, females with kittens. Um, so again, it was kind of cool because you know science, you come up with your hypothesis, it doesn't, it, your data doesn't always follow your hypothesis. Some scientists like to make their data follow their, their hypothesis. I just kind of let my data speak for itself, but it was pretty cool that it was kind of what we had expected, you know, that they're choosing to be closer to these buildings, but they don't want to be too close, unless maybe there's good, good cover in the body. So what that looks like on the ground, you can see this, right? This, this is one bobcat. You can see he had the option to use this big track of land here, big track of land here. But where is he spending all this time, right? All along where the disturbed habitat is, near houses, where the prey is. Again, you've created perfect bobcat habitat uh, in suburbia. Um, another good example here, this is a more even um, rural area. And um, again, this is based on availability too. So it takes into account every all the habitat types that are available. 
So this is a really cool one that you see right here. This is actually North Bridgeport, the guy that I was talking about. So this is, if you were to zoom out of this, it's all super urban city habitat. So this, this bobcat will use this travel corridor to come down the highway and get into this. This is the old Winchester Arms uh, where they used to do their um, test firing. But you can see even within this patch of habitat, right, this cat's really not using a lot of this interior of the patch. It's kind of sticking along the edge where that thick habitat is and where it's near buildings where the food is. <coughs> uh, we did a little bit of den work um, looking at kittens. Um, haven't really analyzed a lot of this data yet, and we're kind of running out of time. I'm going to keep you, here, you guys here all night. Um, what we were finding about uh, one to four kittens, one to three kittens per litter. Um, a lot of dens were just kind of in old logs, underneath fallen logs. Uh, we plan to do some more analysis with this data. Um, but it was pretty interesting and pretty difficult. I could do a whole talk on just trying to find bobcat dens. It was, it was very, <laughs> very tricky. Um, we pulled the kittens out when they were still small enough where they couldn't run away from us. We would ear tag them, um, just get a good idea of reproduction, especially you know in those urban areas. Uh, we did a lot of kill site investigation. So again, bobcats are taking down full grown bucks. Um, this you know was giving us a better idea of what bobcats are eating, and it kind of our data kind of went along with what we were finding from bobcat stomachs. They eat deer. They eat primarily squirrels and rabbits. Um, again, it'll take down larger, larger animals. Um, so again, to kind of confirm what we were finding in our stomach contents, we use isotope analysis, which is isotopes that can kind of stay in the fur for a long time. Again, I'm not going to get into the science, the details on it, just trust me on it. Um, and we looked across like low exurban, high exurban, and suburban. So it's kind of like I guess you could look at it as like rural all the way up to suburban. Um, hit it one more time, Rach. Okay, so basically, you know, there's a lot of small herbivores, squirrels. As you get into more suburban areas, um, hit it one more time, Rach. So we found a little more deer in those lower exurban areas, which kind of makes sense. But really, this followed along with um, the data we were finding from the stomachs, uh, which was good. You know, so we kind of know what species bobcats are targeting in Connecticut. Um, real quick, you know, there, there's so much. I mean, I could I could do a presentation for like five hours on on the data we've collected. A lot of this would be in different publications. But just another interesting thing we found. So these male bobcats, um, when they when they when their home ranges were in low building density, their home ranges were about 32.7 kilometers squared, and when they were in high building density, their home ranges were close to 120 kilometers squared. So really, what that has to do with is just a mechanism of you have these like little mini travel corridors, and bobcats were moving from patch to patch. So instead of just kind of finding what they need within their home range, they had to make these large movements in corridors to find um, different habitat patches. And that's kind of one of the things we're going to be looking at in our third and final field season, which is going on right now. Um, so we're also going to be looking at interactions between animals. So this is a male and a female. Um, this will just kind of give you an idea of what happens with mating behavior in February. So we can see the cats come together, and they spend roughly about 48 hours together. And after that 40 hours, boom, they're gone. They don't want to see each other anymore. Uh, so pretty typical uh, bobcat meeting behavior. So we hope to document more of how this interaction, these interactions happen. Um, and we want to look at, are these interactions more common in urban areas, right? Because bobcats are forced into these corridors. And is there more overlap between home ranges? So kind of getting this idea of how we want to maybe, when we conserve and protect habitat in the future in Connecticut, what we want that to look like, right? So bobcats can persist in these urban areas because we want them there. 
Um, so that's kind of the goal of this final um, season that we're doing right now. So a lot of this data is still kind of being collected, analyzed. So you guys are some of the first to hear the results of this study. Um, again, most of it will be published over the next few years. Um, but that's, that's kind of what we're doing right now. Um, if you ask me to come back and give another talk in three years, I can probably give you all the final results <laughs> of this stuff. But this is kind of like what we've done so far. So are you saying that in urban areas, bobcats are spending more calories trying to get prey? Or are they getting more prey that it balances out for the calories they have to Yeah, spend? that's exactly right. Yeah, so they're probably moving more, right? Well, we know they're moving more. But there's so much more prey there. There's more McDonald's. That it's kind of an it's kind of an offset, right? So they're spending more calories, but they're getting more calories. Okay. Yeah. So it's you know from a Bobcat's perspective, it's not a bad thing. Um, I just want to say thank you to the Heartland Land Trust for hosting this. Um, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the Heartland Land Trust, but it's a great organization. Um, we do a lot as far as protecting these wild spaces. Even though we live in a town like Heartland where we do have lots of, of wild spaces, that can change quickly, right? So I encourage anyone that cares about this stuff to contact the Heartland Land Trust, get involved. I think they got some nice swag back there for sale and things. And this, this could be anything from donating your time, uh, if you're so lucky to have land, you know, it's donating land, it's really a great way to protect your land. And you know what, I don't know all the details, they can give you more, but even things like conservation easements where you can keep ownership of your land, but donate the easements so that it can't be developed. Am I correct on that? Yes. All right, good. <laughs> so talk to one of them after if you're interested. It's a great organization. Oh, I also want to say thank you to Bethany Church for hosting. Uh, it's a great church if anyone's looking for a church in town. Um, and I go to church here so you guys can ask me your Bobcat questions. Uh, one more question. All right, so any, I know I went a little bit over, not too much. Questions from anyone? Yes. You, in all the things that you showed that you found in their stomach, I didn't see anything about dogs and cats and chickens, things like are coming. Yeah, so again, that that data was a little bit old, right? So that's not from this research where we're actually documenting the kill sites. Um, we have found a few domestic poultry kills, right? So where they're they're going get, killing guinea fowl. In people's yards, ducks, chickens. I'm thinking chicken coops. Oh, yep. got chicken coops in yeah, surprising, that. surprisingly, it doesn't seem, I think there's enough natural prey out there. Not saying they don't, they certainly do go after chickens. Um, but we kind of get a snapshot, right, like of what they're eating. So they might be eating it more other times of the year, or different cats might have like a habit of doing that. Um, in all the bobcat stomachs I've looked in from roadkill cats, I can think of like three or four that I found domestic cat in their stomach. So it's it's just not something that kind of coyotes are more prone to that. Kind of oh, coyotes, yeah, different story. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, people call me and they say, "Oh, a fisher killed my cat, or a bobcat killed my cat," and I said, "Well, did you see it?" And they're like, "No, but I heard a fisher screaming in my yard, which is probably a red fox." And I say it's much more likely that your cat was taken by a coyote, not a bobcat or a fisher. Yes? Do the uh, cats only den when they breed? Correct. And do they come back to the same den year after year? Uh, we have not seen it. Um, it seems like they kind of den whenever they're ready to give birth. They just pick the nearest like thick area to get into. And they'll, they'll also regularly move their dens. So as their kittens get a little older, or if they get disturbed, they'll move their den site. Multiple times we've found that they'll regularly move their den sites just to kind of keep ahead of maybe predators or switching urban areas, you know, if there's a lot of human activity. Um, no, but I don't believe we've, doc we've documented any den leaves. We have bears, but no, but it's, 
bears will go back to their old dens? Uh, not commonly, but yeah, okay. they will. Yep. yep. It's bears have a lot of personality. Some of them will reuse the same den a lot. Others will never reuse the same den. Is there much competition between bobcat and coyote for areas and prey? Um, there's some, right? But I think for the most part, you're, so like I always try to think of it from the perspective of the animal. If you're a coyote and you come across a bobcat, right? Like so, bobcats are, are fairly solitary. They don't they don't run in packs. So there's just one. So there's not a lot of competition. And is it worth it biologically for you to tangle with an animal with razor blades? Uh, on all four paws and teeth, you know what I mean? So I don't, I don't think there's a ton of interaction or competition between, between the two. I'm sure it does happen, um, but I, I, don't, I don't think it's really a big deal with coyotes specifically. Yes? I have a question. Um, uh, when bobcats do, I guess, rarely kill deer, mm -hmm. do they try to bite them in the back of the neck to sever the spot? So they'll, they'll ambush, and you know, very often it's kind of like a deer is walking by and they're you know, underneath a log or in some thick brush, and they'll latch on, and they almost always latch on underneath, and they'll hang on, and they'll go for the trachea and just hold on and try to crush the yeah. trachea. Okay. It can be pretty brutal to watch, but I mean, it's nature they got to make a living. A number of years ago in West Ireland, we had a couple of deer hanging on a meat pole one night. Come up the next morning, we're missing half a hind quarter. Mm -hmm. A bobcat came up that night, went up the tree on top, and just sat there and ate away. Yeah, <laughs> that's an easy meal. <laughs> Can't blame them. Do you have any bobcats collared in this area in Harton? Um, no, this third field season, we're really focusing on um, Farmington Valley, so like those real urban, like Hartford, West Hartford, Bloomfield, but we did have a few collared, not too far from here, didn't we? I can't think of it. We've had a few in Canton and Granby, so pretty close by. But there's, yeah, my dad just saw a bobcat in his yard last week. So yeah, they're, they're around for sure. So they're still protected. There's no hunting season for them at all. Correct. Zero. Trapping? There's no harvest whatsoever right now. Since 72. Correct. So what that could change. We know we have a population that can sustain a harvest. Um, but there's a lot of legislative steps to go through to make that happen. But what are their major predators? Um, their major predators are probably F-150s. I was going to say, it's hard to call it a predator. Source of mortality is certainly vehicles. Um, to a much lesser extent, other bobcats. Um, and probably to an even lesser extent, maybe coyotes at times will take them. But yeah, they're sort of a medium-sized apex predator here in Connecticut. Yes. Do you see any evidence of untangling with bears? No, I have. I have never seen evidence. Nor, if I was a bobcat, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen where they were walking through the woods when we were doing our winter den work, and they smell or whatever sense that a bear is there in the den, and their tracks will go whoop, <laughs> and then come back. So they'll, I think, avoid them intentionally. Yes. In your research, do you find that the bobcats prefer a fresh kill, or are they okay yes. with uh, carrion? And, uh, they definitely prefer fresh kill. In fact, when we're trapping, if our bait starts to get an odor to it, say we're using like a chunk of deer meat or something, we'll have to change it out because they're in general they don't like rotting meat. They will scavenge, especially in the winter when the meat stays fresh. Um, but yeah, they, they prefer fresh and, and kill the body themselves. Your, your study showed that uh, bobcats were uh, responsible for more fawn mortality mm -hmm. than bears. Mm -hmm. How about coyotes? 
So coyotes were on there, and they were probably all under unknown. And the reason for that is every time, probably most of the time when you try to get to a fawn that was killed by coyotes, there's nothing left because there's multiple coyotes. Right. So, that, so we couldn't really say it was a coyote, so it just went under unknown. But most of those unknowns were probably coyotes, but still a smaller chunk than right. was killed by bobcats. Thanks. Any other questions? All right. Thank you guys for having us.